I have been asked for a chance to talk about how to fix She-Hulk. And I do think you can fix the She-Hulk show, I do. But to do that, it starts with understanding how the show came to be in the first place. Fundamentally, the show was doomed to fail from the start. I was watching that Star Wars girl doing a video about the show itself, and she read from an article that revealed the director's motives and goals with the show during planning, and it explained pretty much everything for me. In the article, it revealed that the director primarily based the events of the show around her own experiences and the experiences of her fellow staff and writing crew. They essentially spent the majority of their time in brainstorming sessions, just sharing stories back and forth. And, and I know some writers will draw on their own experiences to help tell the stories that they want. I wanted to know, were you able to put yourself into this series beyond just the comedy? Because you're a very funny person by, by nature from everything I've seen. So, Well, the secret to television writing is really all we do in the writer's room is mine each other's lives. I mean, it's just constant cheating. Right. <laughs> we, so we had a fantastic writing staff and we had so much fun in the writer's room because we just kind of sat around and like everybody told stories about, I mean, that's true of every writer's room I've been in. You sit around, sure. everybody tells stories about their life experiences, weirdos that they've known, ho horrifically embarrassing situations that they've been in. You know, everybody kind of just shares all of their deepest, darkest secrets and all their trauma. And then we're like, great, now we're going to use it for comedy. Thank you. She argued that She-Hulk isn't supposed to be like other superheroes. She doesn't have some major villain to defeat. She doesn't want to fight to save the world or the universe. She isn't out trying to find her long-lost family, nor is she trying to overcome the hurdles of what it means to be a superhero. She's not even wrestling with the conflicts of moral decision-making as a superhuman. She is simply a reflection and self-insertion of the director and her crew. When building out this series, what were key elements that you wanted to ensure define the series rather than just being a part of the MCU? What I love about TV is that unlike the movies, you actually have the time and the space to really like sit with the character and live with them and like get to see their regular life, you know, because you, you can hang out with them week to week, you know, for half an hour, an hour at a time um, and really get to know them. Whereas in the movies, it's always like high stakes. They're always busy saving yes. the universe. They don't have time to like worry about anything else, which means that we don't <laughs> get to see whether or not they have families, whether or not they have friends, you know, whether or not they do normal things. But of course, they're all still human. So at some point, there is going to be a day of the week where the universe does not need to be saved. And that's the day where they're going to have to do laundry. You know, they're going to have to go have dinner with their parents and listen to their mom, like tell them, when are you going to give me grandkids? You know, they're going to have to like fight with Spectrum Cable over like the coverage, you know, in their neighborhood. And so that's really where the show lives is kind of seeing that, that those moments, the kind of minutia of everyday life. This is the primary problem with She-Hulk. But I can't be too harsh on the show alone because this is a problem with a lot of story writing these days. Self-insertion is a pox on good storytelling, and I'm here to explain why. I should start by pointing out that it's almost impossible to totally divorce yourself from your writing. That's why every writer or director has a certain style, something about them that will often shine through in their production, characters, and attitude. But your job as a writer is to try and avoid doing this if you can. Now, there are various reasons why. The first is because of your own personal bias. It becomes very difficult to talk poorly about yourself or confess to your own shortcomings when talking about yourself, and that means you run the risk of walking down the path of the Mary Sue. Mary Sues are often self-insert characters. In fact, the original Mary Sue from Star Trek fan fiction was a literal self-insert fan fiction story, so you can see the connection. When you write yourself, you want to make yourself the hero, and you want to avoid the shortcomings or errors that might hinder you or make people dislike you. You will twist the plot in such a way as to make everything work out the way you want it to. There will be little struggle, little need for self-reflection or growth, because what growth do you even need? You're there. You've finished the race. You know all there is to know, and your only concern is either getting the girl or guy of your dreams in your story, or beating the bad guy and winning all the praise, or just, you know, being totally awesome because being totally awesome is what you are. In She-Hulk's case, it's not even that. It's using an existing character, She-Hulk, to exploit, to exposit your own outlooks and experiences. It's the equivalent of a 33-year-old woman taking the character of She-Hulk, being given tons of money, and instead of making a show based around her comics, using her own diary as a source material. It will be boring to the vast majority of audiences, preachy to the people who are tired of hearing the pandering, and insulting to people who actually like She-Hulk. Newsflash! No one wants to read a diary when they pay to see a superhero show. And this brings up the second problem. Ready for the Bible verse of the day? Galatians 6, 3. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You're not that important. I love that last part personally. You're not that important. You're not that special. Stop walking around like the world revolves around you. See, the problem with self-insert stories is the writer thinks that they are that important. But your audience doesn't. 
When you go in to see a movie, the first thing the film has to do is give you a reason to care about the protagonist. We are not expected to care by virtue of them being the protagonist. Something about them has to endear us to them. But a self-insert character often provides no reasoning, because they don't need to. Since they are writing as if the character is them, then they already see themselves as the most valuable aspect of the story, and will forget to make the audience care. But we can take the whole Bible verse and apply it to it, the concept, you know. No character can stand on their own. Take Saitama from One Punch Man, for example. Many would argue he is too Gary Stu-esque. He's too powerful, because he's so powerful he can beat any enemy he faces. And that would be very boring and uninteresting if it only focused on him. But rather, it focuses on the world around Saitama and the people he interacts with daily. It's about the interactions, the connections. Everyone plays a role. Why? Because a story's plot is dictated by the interactions of characters in their, in their environment. The conflict from the story comes not from how difficult Saitama's enemy is and how much struggles he has trying to defeat them, but rather the struggles he has as a character through his interactions with other people. Saitama seeks a thrill from being a hero because he's bored on his own because he's bored about his own power, you know. And Saitama claims that through his incredible power, he's losing his emotions. Now, along the way, he meets a cyborg named Genos, who sees Saitama as an amazing hero and wants to be his disciple. This annoys Saitama, but with nothing better to do, Saitama tries to teach Genos what he knows, even though he himself is unsure how he obtained his own power. Genos, meanwhile, tries to put these lessons to action in his daily life, creating funny conflict and interactions through their personalities and misunderstandings of each other. Meanwhile, a ninja named Sonic meets Saitama, hating that Saitama is so much more powerful than him, and wants to prove he can defeat Saitama using his awesome martial arts ninja killing techniques and speed. Saitama sees Sonic as an annoying individual and defeats him, only for Sonic to try again and again and again, only to meet pretty much the same end result. Very Looney Tunes-esque the more I think about it. Saitama loses his temper with both of these characters, which is unique, seeing as Saitama admitted he was losing his emotions. Thus, implying that the interaction with others was helping to stimulate emotion. When you are the only character in your story, when there is no interaction outside of self-congratulations and self-worship, where the only thing other characters do is praise your exploits, then you are left with nothing. The story becomes boring and uninvesting. Your audience won't crave the character or desire investment in their story because they have no presence in their own world. The self-insert becomes an anathema, an outlier. You have now inserted a character that makes no sense within their own world. It would be the equivalent of dropping a robot from the year 4000 into a story about Vikings. Not only does the character obviously not function in this world, but its very presence would alter the story you're telling irrevocably. However, that story about the robot in the Viking world would at least be more entertaining to follow because we could see how the Vikings and the robot would interact. A self-insert character with no self-awareness will not even have the decency to explore that possibility. But the largest and most important problem of all is the fact that when creating a self-insert character, you will almost always make the audience angry, particularly when they hijack a story. This is particularly a problem when, in fan fiction, the self-insert character is inserted into an existing world. That's why She-Hulk irritates fans of the She-Hulk comics. That's why Quan irritated the Halo community in the Halo TV show. And that's why people don't like Starfire's daughter in the new Starfire's daughter story. When you deliberately inject yourself into a world in which you don't belong, people will notice, especially when you're not subtle about it. She-Hulk ranting about the evils of sexism and catcalling doesn't sound natural in a world like the MCU, where characters fight world-ending threats almost regularly, or to a character like the Hulk, who has battled far more personal demons than Jin could ever dream of. Your life experience, while unique and special to you, will contrast poorly in a world unlike ours. In a world like the MCU, no one cares about your feminist agenda when they're fighting world-ending calamities almost every day. In a world like Halo, no one is going to cry for a teenage delinquent who does drugs on the side while talking back to authority figures because they're dealing with the end of humanity. In a world like DC, no one is going to sympathize with a daughter of a fan-favorite character who disrespects her mom, wears goth makeup, and tries to come to terms with their sexuality. As special as you think your experiences are, you have a larger world to consider. So, with that said, how do you avoid self-inserts? It's a difficult thing to do because you're used to writing with your own voice and feelings. You want to apply your own thoughts and wants to your characters and positions. What can sometimes help is perhaps interviewing your characters to learn more about them. Imagine there's someone you're talking to and ask them a series of questions and check to see how they reply, such as to see if all of your interests align. If they do, you might need to rethink them a bit. 
Sometimes I find it helpful to write a character who comes from a background or area different from myself. As a writer, it's your job to think creatively with what you have before you. And if you're inserting a character into an existing story, then you must be doubly careful. Creativity is not hindered by the rules of storytelling and consistency, but instead strengthened by it. I think it's a silly thing to assume that you can't create a character without writing what you know. The statement, write what you know, is ludicrous. Of course you can write to your own experiences, but do you think George Lucas was ta talking from his own experiences when directing Star Wars? Do you think Steven Spielberg was, using, was used to fleeing dinosaurs in Jurassic Park and wanted to make a movie about it? Do you think Rowling really attended a wizard school because her parents were killed by the Dark Lord? Or do you think Kipling was really raised by wolves in a jungle? No. Of course they weren't. Authors can, of course, borrow concept and experiences to get the ball rolling. But the great authors will learn and be willing to step outside of what they know to grow beyond their own experiences and craft a world beyond their own understanding. And in doing so, build a new world. Take, for example, J.R.R. Tolkien. The man was a brilliant linguist, was a man who invented his own language, loved studying culture, religion, history. The man spent his time hiking through the mountains. He was a fascinating individual. Now, he used those experiences to help enrich the world of Lord of the Rings, but do you think he really just wanted to write Frodo based on himself? Do you think he wanted to write Aragorn based on himself? Do you think he wanted to write Gandalf based on himself? No, of course he didn't. Because the reality was that he was a great author who recognized that even though his experiences and his knowledge could help enrich this world in a new way, he knew that he couldn't tell the story of himself in this world. And that, I think, is the big problem. Self-insert characters discourage creativity. You're not trying to reach outside of what you know. You're not trying to reach into new understandings and new ideas about creating a world. And you're not respecting the world you're creating. What you're doing is you're shoving yourself selfishly into a story where you don't belong. Now, am I saying you can never write about yourself? Absolutely not. You totally can. I have written characters based on myself before. And I've enjoyed doing it. It's fine. But with that said, respect has to be given to the world you're creating. You first need to recognize that the world you're creating is not meant to bow to your whim. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is you must recognize that your character must be prepared to invoke upon flaws, mistakes, errors, and personal dilemma. If you are going to create a character that has none of these things, get ready for a very bored audience. And finally, you have to make sure that you give your audience a reason to care about your character outside of the fact that they're you. If I wrote a story and I published it and I didn't make anything else interesting or unique about my character, give them any kind of drive or direction to do, then guess what? People are going to be very bored. That's the problem I had with She-Hulk saying right out the gate that she didn't want to be a hero, that she didn't want to help save people, that she didn't want to take responsibility to her powers. Here's a fascinating thing. I've been in a debate with a lot of people lately about Tom Holland being Spider-Man, and a lot of them are arguing that Tom Holland is the worst Spider-Man for multiple different reasons, and I've been having a debate about whether or not that's true or not. But here's the amazing thing. Whether you like Tom Holland as a Spider-Man or not, there are a few things about Tom Holland that I can appreciate. For one, he does make mistakes. He does have errors. His juvenile nature shows. Secondly, he wants to make a difference. He wants to make a change. He wants to take responsibility to his powers, even as early as his first appearance in Civil War. Okay? He wants to be involved. And finally, there is a unique drive to this character. He has desires. He has wants. He has goals to achieve at the end of the day. There are things that make us want to see him succeed. So whether you think he's the worst Spider-Man or not, he at least fulfills the criteria of an honestly good protagonist. Can we say the same thing about She-Hulk or Quan or any of these other characters that were clearly just self-inserts for the writer slash director? No, we can't because She-Hulk has no directive. She already has her own office in, her own, in, in the law firm. She already is working with the DA's office. She's already where she wants to be and even complains that getting to be She-Hulk would ruin that possibility. She can control her She-Hulk powers perfectly. She doesn't have to worry about losing control in the session because she can do it all fine on her own. And if trouble did show up, she doesn't have to worry about being inexperienced because she can already do everything better than the Hulk can. Do you see why this doesn't work? By inserting yourself and your own experiences into your um, story, you've not only disrespected the world that you've inserted your character into, but disrespected your audience who wanted to care about your character. So already you failed on the fundamental level of creating a good protagonist. How can you call that good writing? You can't. Which is why I tell you, as my lovely audience, my lovely students who wish to learn the art of writing, I tell you this from the bottom of my heart. 
It is not a sign of a lack of creativity that you try to do something different. It is a sign of a lack of creativity when you try to just tell what you know. When you only tell based on your own experience, you are telling very, very little. Now, some of you might say, but I don't want to risk coming off as uneducated. I don't want to risk offending anybody. For example, I'm a Christian. I might not know enough about a Muslim background to write a story about a Muslim character. And you know what? You'd be right. So what's the answer? Research, study, ask questions, discover, learn, grow. Isn't that what people keep telling you to do in the media? Educate yourself. But not educate yourself to not be a bigot. Educate yourself so that you can understand things better. And thus, as a writer, help build on your understanding and experience. I'm probably never going to travel the cosmos. I can still write a space adventure story. I'm probably never going to cast a magic spell. I can still write about a witch. I am probably never going to be a race car driver. I can still write about, write about a NASCAR rider. How do you do it? You learn. You grow. You get creative. You take risks. You try new things. You experiment with what you're creating. But if the only thing you do is say, I'm going to write a superhero. Oh, that's cool. But they're going to be just like me in every capacity then what makes them super? They win all their fights. That's not interesting. You need more than that. And that's what I'm trying to say here. So, look forward to my video in the future where I talk about how we could fix She-Hulk, some steps that I would take to try to fix that story outside of just burning the whole thing and starting from scratch. But other than that, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you learned something from it. And I will see you in my next video. Take care.